I'm Stephanie, and welcome to Wine Club. This is the playlist where I drink good wine while I whine about bad books. And today's offender is a book that I'd been saving for spooky season, which is A Haunting on the Hill by Elizabeth Hand. Warning, there are going to be spoilers in this review. And as I say in all my reviews, this is solely about the book and not about the author as a person. I'm sure she is absolutely lovely. There will be a non-spoiler review of this book in my What I Read in October video. So if you want to understand what the book is about without being spoiled, check that out. Otherwise, I will be spoiling everything in this. But let's go ahead and see what this promised first. Open the door. Holly Sherwin has been a struggling playwright for years. But now, after receiving a grant to develop her play, Witching Night, she may finally be close to her big break. All she needs is time and space to bring her vision to life. When she stumbles across Hill House on a weekend getaway upstate, she is immediately taken in by the mansion, nearly hidden outside a remote village. It's enormous, old, and ever so eerie. The perfect place to develop and rehearse her play. Despite her own hesitations, Holly's girlfriend, Nisa, agrees to join Holly in renting the house for a month. And soon, a troop of actors, each with ghosts of their own, arrive. Yet, as they settle in, the house's peculiarities are made known. Strange creatures stalk the grounds, disturbing sounds echo through the halls, and time itself seems to shift. All too soon, Holly and her friends find themselves at odds, not just with each other, but with the house itself. It seems something has been waiting in Hill House all these years, and it no longer intends to walk alone. So this was fine. I didn't love it, and I wasn't hate reading it, but I will say I was definitely skimming at the end just to have it be over. Now, I will say when the scary scenes hit, they hit really well. Hand definitely has a knack for adding tension and a sense of foreboding to the spooky scenes. And I also really like that it was committed to being spooky and that the creepy things started right away. But I also do think that kind of bugged me. <laughs> it bugged me that the creepy things are happening before they've even rented the house. And Holly eventually, even before they rent the house, she seems quite scared of the place, but then still goes through with renting it, and then refuses to leave when she's been warned some serious shit will go down in this house. And she refuses to leave when said shit starts to go down. Like, I'm sorry, I'm all for ghosts, and my husband has indulged my interest by spending the night at haunted hotels, but if something truly weird were to happen, we would be out of there like that. And these people freak out over like the smallest little things, but when like real scary stuff starts happening, they don't seem phased at all. Like, what? So this book is the definition of an idiot plot. It only works because everyone in this house is a moron. Not only are they like closing their eyes so they can't see all the red flags, they are also horrible, horrible people. Two pages in and I wanted to punch Nisa. So that's Holly's girlfriend. I wanted to punch her right in the throat. How are you gonna sing now, Nisa? Because that's all she does. Well, and this is your final spoiler warning. Nisa is always singing because her voice is hauntingly beautiful and doesn't she know it. But Nisa is also cheating on Holly with Stevie, Holly's friend and a fellow artist. And Nisa is always thinking about how amazing she is and how talented she is and how it's so unfair that Holly is taking credit for the play when really the play would be a piece of trash without Nisa's songs and her amazing voice. God, she's just so self-centered and such a brat. But unfortunately, everyone in this is. All of the characters are insufferable. So we also have Amanda, who's the actress that Holly wants to play the lead in her play. And like Nisa, Amanda is 
constantly internal monologuing about what a gift from God she is to these peasants. They should be worshipping at her feet for agreeing to do this play. Even though she seems to have a pretty big scandal in her past where she may or may not have taken the life of a fellow actor by pushing him off a catwalk. Honestly, even Holly gets in on being a terrible character by the end when her little, like, dark secret is revealed. And it's, I mean, it's not great, but it's basically she stole somebody else's, like, trauma and turned it into a play without crediting the woman who told Holly her story. And then that woman ends up taking her own life due to the publicity surrounding this story. And in the end, Holly is crying because this woman's voice was silenced. Yeah, by you, Holly. Don't give me those crocodile tears. I don't believe you. And then there's also Stevie, who is, he's, tra he's a tragic character because he's bad for hooking up with Nisa behind Holly, his so-called best friend's back, but he also has a lot of trauma that he's still dealing with. I honestly thought Stevie was my favorite, minus his cheating and lying to Holly. Like, not cool, Steve. Not cool. It kind of just sucks because I had no one to really root for in this. I didn't feel attached to anyone. I'd have really loved for the characters to be likable at first, and I could understand this group of friends and even like Amanda finding her way into it. And then they become influenced by the house and become these awful people. But they start out unlikable. It'd be like if Umbridge wore the Horcrux locket. I don't care that you're suffering. I actually want you to suffer. I don't feel any tension around the things that might happen to them because I just don't like them. So not only are they annoying in their own heads, but the dialogue felt really off in this as well. Also, quick aside, we start the book with Holly in her first person point of view for like the first 10 chapters, and then suddenly we get other people's point of views, but theirs are in third. What the fuck? Now, I will caveat that because 10 chapters seems like a long wait to introduce other points of views, and it is, but it's also not. Because this book's chapters are comically short, like two to three pages in length. Chapter 11 starts on page 34. And some of the chapter breaks are pretty pointless as the next chapter picks up right where we left off. It makes the book feel like it's going a lot faster than it is, but I also didn't love it. Like, I guess on the one hand, you'd be like, oh yeah, I read like 30 chapters tonight because you've read 60 pages. Anyway, back to the unrealistic dialogue. It really reminded me of The Last One by Will Dean, which I also have a wine club episode on, but the dialogue just didn't feel natural. It was stilted so that the characters could say what they needed to say, even if it didn't fit the current conversation. Or conversations would go in circles. I was just, I was not a fan. Most of this book is the characters thinking about how wonderful they are and how much everyone else sucks. Believe me, I know. And then some weird stuff happens, but they say it's fine. I repeat, idiot plot in full force here. That and some seriously forced miscommunication. Like the acting group is warned to leave, but the warnings are really vague and really cryptic, meant to be creepy, but it's downright annoying and nonsensical. Say that people have died. Say people get attacked by things that aren't there. Actually give them a reason to leave instead of like, oh, if you stay, bad things are gonna happen. Like, ugh. I mean, it's, it sucks either way because both sides are idiots. I also have to say the pace is very, very slow for most of the book until like we have our final showdown between the characters and the house, but then it's done. But reading about these little drama llamas made the book feel like it drags for the majority of the page count. I honestly felt like Hand wanted to write a story about a woman writing a play about witches and comes across a real coven, but then she was asked by Jackson Estate to write a story about Hill House and just kind of smashed the two stories together. But it doesn't really work. So there's a lot of focus on the owner of Hill House, 
probably being a witch and in cahoots with the housekeeper who refuses to spend the night and the woman who lives near the property. They also apparently have familiars that take the shape of a black hair, but maybe they're rabbits, but no, they're hares. But it might be a rabbit, but no, they're hares. And people are going to continually call them rabbits and then say hares. Nobody cares. Because like the idea of the witches, this eventually goes nowhere. There's no payoff. It's just these black hairs everywhere. It's just there. I know that it's meant to tie into the play that Holly is working on, but then make it mean something because it ultimately means nothing. And yep, the house is haunted and now Nisa has been pulled into the walls and is a ghost now at the end? I, I don't know. The ending was quite a rush and wraps up things extremely quickly, but also doesn't really wrap anything up. Is it the house? Are the women actually witches who live down the street and they're doing something? Who knows? Not me. Not me, obviously. Which is a shame because I love books about witches, but commit. Again, it just feels like Hand already had this other idea and then got the setting of Hill House and said, yep, I'll take it. I'm gonna whoosh these two stories together without actually doing the proper work. I also have to say one other thing that took away from this reading experience was some of the language and words that were used. There were a lot of words that I don't know that I just, I wasn't going to look up. I assume I didn't miss much by not knowing the definition of certain words, but hand, I get it. You're very smart. You can use a thesaurus. Congratulations. Now, the one thing that I really did like was when Stevie was trying to record like ambient noise around the house for the play and they start hearing echoes of previous tenants like a haunting slash reality warp. That was a really cool scene and had some touches of other typical hauntings like the change in temperature and the sense of something just being wrong. I really did like some of the haunting scenes but they're so far and few in between. Overall, the story is okay, and I did like when the house started preying upon the characters and haunting them, as it is disturbing and it delivered on the atmosphere. But it's not enough to make up for the story's shortcomings. This really was not the horror or haunted house story that I was expecting it to be. In the end, I ended up giving this two and a half stars. I really do want to try another title by hand as I would be curious what she could do with like her own world and a setting that's all her own and maybe a cast of characters who aren't awful awful people. I would love to see it. But if you have any recommendations for haunted house stories that are actually good, please leave your recs in the comments below. Otherwise, thanks for joining me at Wine Club.